everyone. Welcome to another webcast in the Iconics Transform Your Business webcast series. Today's webcast is simple scriptless SCADA reduces engineering time. Don't use scripting when you can do without it. Before we get started, my name is Amanda Gordon. I'm the Senior Marketing Programs Manager here at Iconics, and I just want to go over a few housekeeping rules. Right now on the call, you are in a listen only mode. That means if you have any questions throughout the webcast, please type them into the question section of the GoToWebinar panel. Now I'll introduce you to our presentation team. We have Oliver Gruner, who's the Corporate Account Director of Mitsubishi Electric. And then we have, he works in the Foxborough office in um, the Iconics headquarters. And we also have Nicole Carter, who's a Product Marketing Manager, who also works at our headquarters in Foxborough, Massachusetts. And with that, I'll first turn things over to Oliver to get us started today. Thank you, Amanda, and um, welcome and thank to everyone joining us um, today at, at our webcast. I wanted to um, really um, extend my gratitude for you to join joining us and spending some time with us this morning or in the, in the afternoon, wherever you are. Before we get started and um, Wanted to talk a little bit about Iconics, but again, my name is Oliver Gruner. I am Corporate Account Director to our parent company, Mitsubishi Electric. So about Iconics, um, Iconics is headquartered in Foxborough, Massachusetts, in the United States, and was established in 1986. So over 30 plus years of invention and innovation. Recently, just last year in August 2019, Iconics became part of the worldwide family of Mitsubishi Electric, which is a longtime partner of ours, giving us some amazing opportunities on an expanded worldwide basis to serve and partner with existing customers as well as really open up a new window in partnering with the Mitsubishi Electric worldwide team. Um, you'll find Iconics in various industries such as factory automation, process automation, automotive, oil and gas, and many more in over 100 countries. Um, we are represented through direct offices or through our valued, valued distributors, OEMs, and systems integrators. These partners and channels are really the backbone of Iconics and um, the value they bring um, enhances the value of Iconics in so many industries and applications. I know there are um, several of our channel distributors and his eyes on the session today, so I wanted to extend a big thank you to you and bring the solutions to life at our customers and the end user sites. Iconics, um, being in business since 1986, has applications installed in over 375,000 locations. So that's a lot of software running, critical apps in so many industries. That's a, really a testament to the depth of the business and the quality of getting into the market through an established and scalable distribution and sales channel. One partnership we are, um, for which we are really particularly proud is our ongoing solid one with Microsoft. Whether it's leveraging Microsoft's wide range of operating systems expertise, um, their broad expertise in productivity applications and tools, or their solid cloud platform, Azure. Our, con con our continued investment in these areas uh, really allowed us to be a repeat award winner with Microsoft as a six-time partner of the year. This broad-based approach and cross-collaboration at the industry level uh, really allows Iconics to not only develop scalable applications, but based on a world-leading technology company, but also allows us to, uh, to gain a leadership position in the transformation of the digital workspace. Um, in addition to being found all over the world, Iconics is also providing services critical in, to critical applications in many specific industries around the world. With a, really with our flexible and adaptable platform, Iconics can be found running critical applications in automotive, utilities, manufacturing, sustain, uh, sustainability markets. So as you can see, the list of industries is extensive and expanding with tremendous opportunity 
as we continue to grow with our new family at Mitsubishi Electric. So that's enough about Iconics. Um, let's jump into the, really the topic of our discussion today, simple scriptless skater functionality. Um, in, let me just start with a little bit of history here on scripting for Iconics, um, for scripting and um, web HMI um, applications over the years. So scripting really, when you go back, you know, with Skater in the 1980s, scripting has always been part of Skater. Um, the clients installed was always fat clients. And even in the 90s, when, when we started to network systems together, clients were always a fat client installed products. So and scripting was part of everything and the script code would always execute because all the DLLs were available on the installed um, client PC. But then you know, really starting in 2000, 20 years ago, Iconics, we have been providing web HMI solutions as native browser um, based applications. So um, our competition really had um, um, a challenge there to do this. Um, we, the reason is that um, they used scripting for very for basic functions within the HMI SCADA applications. For example, thinking back um, iFix or Win, Siemens WinCC, if you put um, a push button on a display to load another this graphic, that was a simple script. Or if you created a, a dynamic action, like a location action to move an object across the screen along a specific path, that was a script. Um, in Iconics technology, we never used scripting for anything of this, um, basic functionality. It was always native. So using having used script in many of our competitors' products, they had a challenge to move to browser-based solutions. We didn't. Um, so that's why we actually started our first web HMI um, solution with our then Genesis City 2 product on Internet Explorer, Netscape Navigator, and starting in 2000. Technology back then was ActiveX controls, and it was really native browser-based solutions. However, many of our customers liked, they have they had been using scripts and they wanted to carry that forward. Um, in order to make that work, they actually had to install VBA script on a client PC, but it wasn't really necessary. But in those interim years, that's what they did. But then we moved, you know, fast forward um, 10 years, we had the Genesis 64 product, and which initially ran browser-based, obviously, always in Internet Explorer, but then, um, the demand for multi-browser environments became very, very um, um, obvious. So customer wanted to run in Chrome, Safari, Firefox. We answered that um, demand by using Microsoft Silverlight plugin, which was actually a great technology. And it made it very easy for us to, um, to easily deploy cloud-based solutions. Um, I'm sorry, browser-based solutions. The issue there was also um, Silverlight didn't support any scripting. so we answered that um, call by creating um, additional functionality that we call commanding. Because customers said we want to do, everybody was thinking about scripts. We created this commanding functionality to make script-like user experiences um, scriptless. And then 2015, really, when you look at this um, HMI, HTML5 became really the standard in, in, in browser-based applications. And Iconics kept expanding um, our commanding um, functionality in Genesis 64. So we made um, commanding a native functionality. So to really uh, make, make it built in so we can make scripting obsolete. So really scripting in our deployments today is really not necessary. And we'll show you when Nicole goes into the demonstration, she'll show you how we do this. So everything is a native functionality and we don't need any add-ons or third-party script engines to provide um, script-like functionality, but with scriptless feature sets. The benefits really are, um, are obvious. You have reduced engineering time and cost um, putting the applications together. We have native support um, in any H, um, in via HTML, HTML5 in any browser. 
um, because all those feature sets are found in the native and very important, easy to upgrade and always backwards compatible. Compatible. That's a very important point as a benefit using um, Iconics and um, browser-based applications. So some of the challenges that not Iconics by, um, alone, but many of our um, competitors and other vendors in the industry is um, there are challenges about scripting. And one of them is moving from a legacy visualization into HTML5. How do you do that? And so Iconics answered that um, um, challenge by expanding the commanding um, feature sets, making scripting obsolete. And we'll show you that obviously in our demo. Um, the, the other challenge is if you, some many vendors use JavaScript or Java to um, as a script engine or um, backbone. Um, some of the issues there is backwards compatibility. So especially when you have large complex scripts, there's always some of that anxiety, will my script still work when I upgrade to the next version? That is an issue um, that needs to be dealt with. Um, but also a challenge is maintaining scripts. When you have people um, creating scripts over years and then may leave the company, now somebody has to pick up uh, where they left off with understanding complex scripts and then uh, to maintain them going forward. Um, we don't have that challenge either because of our um, native um, functionality in the product. So let me give you a quick kind of a hierarchy of our scriptless features in Genesis 64. So look at, uh, I'm looking at this at three different levels. One is a project level. Um, where you have project level actions that, that are required outside of an asset hierarchy in a dashboard or any specific displays. We have several tools that you can use. One of them is Workflow and it's, um, it's relatively new. And um, I wanna show that to you a little bit how you can use Workflow as a project level um, tool to create those actions. Then on the next level is what we call global commanding. These are actions within an asset hierarchy in a dashboard that apply across multiple displays. And um, we'll show that to you and um, how that's going to work in our demo. And then further down, you look at an individual GraphWorks 64 display. They have display level actions that we provide to replace scripting and make that obsolete. We're using commanding in there, global aliasing, smart symbols, and others, and we'll demonstrate that to you. Let's um, just quickly talk about workflow as a scriptless project level action set that you can apply outside of any of your hierarchies and displays. So as you see, workflow is a graphical, um, easy to use editor, and therefore it's easy to maintain. It's always backwards compatibility. Let me just zoom in a little bit and give you an idea what we're doing here. I'm not going into too much detail, but what this depicts is um, our um, solutions team was creating a Mitsubishi electric robot demo. And so we were, was a pick and, um, pick and place demo where the robot would pick between two different products, one in color blue and one in color white, and it would, would um, receive an order and then move products from one palette to another. It has to detect it and has to figure out what color it is. We understand natively you would do this in a PLC program, but in the demo, we being iconics, we felt compelled to use our own tools to do that. And this is what you see here. Um, it can get very complex, but it can also be simple. So what you see there, these diamonds, they are basically, um, they're conditional blocks in which you can execute logic. And in this case, when you see there on the upper left, there's a start button, the script runs every few seconds. It will check if there is um, a command that needs to be filled as an order. It will execute a, a, a query and database query and then store this in um, local variables so that you don't have to access a database constantly within that workflow. And it will go through the sequence. Um, I'm not going into too much detail on that. On the right-hand side, you will see we're also commanding the gripper, the robot gripper to, to pick and to release and open and close. So it, there's some um, very good logic in there. And the way we do this, I wanted to show that to you here, 
is, um, let me just zoom in on that a little bit. So there again on the diamonds, these are the logical um, blocks, the conditional blocks. You can create new logic within um, these condition settings. And there is the editor, a, our, um, our um, script, ed I'm sorry, our expression editor that you can use that is, um, that is used across all our products. So what you see here is a screenshot. We got string functions, array functions, time date functions, or the typical arithmetic relational logic or bitwise function. You can check and select to create your logic as simple or as complex as it may be. So that gives you an idea of how you can use workflow as a graphical editor to create project-wide actions without scripting. Um, next up is the, the global commanding that we use and on our asset hierarchy. These are actions within that asset hierarchy applying across multiple displays. So you can create in the con in configuration mode a command and it can be placed on any level within your asset hierarchy. You see here we have manufacturing plant, we have multiple lines and within each line we have a machine level. So you can place commanding on every level of the asset tree. And as you configure them, icons are placed automatically in the tree and you can combine multiple commands on each asset level and they get just these, these commands and these icons get stacked up and they're available to you. On the right-hand side is an overview of the global commands that are available to you. But at this point, um, really, um, I think I set it up so you get a good understanding what scriptless feature sets, what it might look like. At this point, I really want to um, hand it over to, to Nicole so that she can walk you through the demo. Nicole, take it from here. Thanks, Oliver. Let me get my screen shown here. All right. So today I'm going to demonstrate a couple of different ways to automate displays without scripting. The first thing we're going to start with is commanding. So what we have here is a glass manufacturing plant display running in Chrome and using HTML5 technology. Over here on this side, as you can see, we have an asset tree. And over here, we have our main display area. Now, we have configured our assets here with a number of commands. As Oliver mentioned, commands are ways to perform different actions. And we can send these actions to different components. So commands initiated from our asset tree can affect our graphics viewer. Commands were designed to replace very common scripting needs. When we created commanding, we took a look at what people were doing with scripting and figured out how we can make that easier for them. Commands can either be executed by selecting an asset or by selecting one of these icons. Most of these commands here load displays. So this one up here loads our production data for 2019. This one owns opens the production data for the selected line. These icons show the OEE data, data for the selected machine. Now when you select a line, it opens the floor plan and zooms in to the particular area for that line. Now let's see how we make these commands work. The first thing we're gonna do is take a look at GraphWorks. Here's our same display that we were looking at, except now we're running it in configure mode in GraphWorks. As you can see, we still have our asset tree over here. And we still have our GraphWorks viewer on this side. Now, the important part I wanna show you here, if I select the GraphWorks viewer, is the commanding name. This is the way that this viewer is identified to the commanding infrastructure. So when a command says it has a target of main viewer, it knows to send it to this particular viewer on this particular screen. Now I'm going to switch over to Workbench and show you how the commands themselves are configured. I'm going to open up our manufacturing plant here. This was the top of our tree. We'll go over to the commands section and we'll see that our manufacturing plant has two commands configured. I'm going to select the load overview floor plan. Now this one is in bold because it is our default command. That means it's the command that gets executed when we select this asset in the tree. This is a load graphics display command. It's loading the floor plan graphics display. And it's setting some aliases, which are a bit easier to see if I open the browse dialog over here. 
and it says the target is the main viewer. So that's how it tells it to open in that particular display. And I can demonstrate this very quick, quickly by selecting the manufacturing plant, and we get our floor plan. Now I'm going to show you how to create one of these commands. It's pretty easy. We just hit the Add button here. You select your command type. As you can see, we have a lot of different commands to choose from. I'm going to stick with the load graphics display for now. We're going to give it a name. We're going to select an icon for it. And we're going to check the directly accessible box. Now what this does is it makes the command available as an icon in the tree so we can easily see it and know it's there for us to click on. We're going to tell it what file name to load. We don't need any aliases this time, so I'm going to leave those blank and tell it what target to load in, our main viewer display, and I'm going to hit apply. Now I switch back over to Chrome. We added this to our manufacturing plant item. So over here is where this icon is going to appear. I'm going to refresh my asset tree. And there's our command that we just added. And if I select it, we get our display. Now you might notice how all of the lines and all of the machines here have the same set of icons. All the lines have the same set and all of the machines have the same set. This is because each line shares an equipment class and each machine shares an equipment class. Equipment classes are templates for assets and we can define commands on those templates. So even though every asset has the same command, they can do slightly different things. For instance, as I showed earlier, when we select a line, it zooms in to the particular point on that display specific to that line. Let's go back to Workbench and look at how commands are configured with parameters to customize them for each asset. I'm going to open up my equipment classes here and open my line template. This is the template that all of our lines share. And to compare it, I'm going to open one of our lines. Let's put them side by side here so we can look at them together. Now you may notice over here on the line, it's got this warning here telling us that if we make any changes, they might get overwritten if we regenerate this from the equipment class. And both sides, I'm gonna select the load line floor plan so we can take a look. Now they look pretty similar except for the global aliases. Over here on the template, if we open up the global aliasing editor, we can see we have some strange looking values here. These are actually parameters. When we instantiate this template, this equipment class, into an actual asset, that asset will supply values for these parameters. And if we look over at the particular asset over here, we can see that indeed the parameters have been replaced with specific values. So, so far we've only looked at load display commands, which are pretty simple. We're gonna take a look at something more complex now. So we're going to open up our template here and take a look at the op analysis report command. This is a batch command. Batch is one of the most powerful command types we have. It runs a series of commands so you can take more than one action with a single click. Furthermore, these commands can include conditions to tell them whether or not to execute. This particular batch command is going to run a report, open a display so that we can see our particular report, and then log either a success or a failure event. Let me demonstrate this very quickly. This icon here is the one that runs our batch command. If I select it, we can see we've got our report screen opened up. And here is a timestamp of just a few seconds ago of the report that we executed. And I can quickly download it and open it up here. There's our report. And at the bottom of the screen, we've logged an event telling us that demo user executed a report for line one. If I go back to Workbench, I'll go over this in a bit more detail. So the first step we have here is a run report. This is a command that actually writes a value. And if we go over here and click on this button, 
we'll open the command editor and see the specifics of how this command is configured. It's a write value command that writes a one to this tag here. This is the execute tag for our particular report. So when we write a one to it, it tells that report to start executing. Our report has one parameter, and this is the name of the line that we want to report on. And when I've selected here, this part is a special alias that's available to all assets, whether you're using an equipment class or on the asset itself. And this gives you the name of the current asset. And this can be useful even outside of equipment classes, because if you ever need to rename your asset, or if you duplicate it or copy it, you don't need to change this value. It'll just automatically take its value from the name of your asset. So after it's executed the run report, it'll go to the next step, which is to load a report display. This is another load graphics display command. If we take a look at the details, we could see it's loading the report status graphic with these aliases in our main viewer. When it's done, it goes to the next step, which is a short delay. This is not actually a command. This is a delay for one second. We're just giving it a little bit of time to make sure the report has had a chance to execute. Then it moves on to the next step, which is to log a success event. Now this step is executing conditionally, which means it may or may not execute based on the result of this condition expression. What we're looking at here is the last executed state of our report. Zero means it's a, excuse me, it's a success. So when the report is a success, it'll execute our command, which is to log an event. If we take a look at the details here, it logs a simple gen event that says the report has been run. And again, we have our special alias here to get the name of this particular asset. Now, when this command is done, we actually want to stop. We don't want to go on to the next log of failure. So we have quit here. But if our condition is false, we'll go to the next step which is to log a failure event. Now, this is very similar to the previous event. It's another command that logs an event. As you can see here, only the message is a little different, telling us that the report has failed. Now, to make these very similar commands to each other, we can use this special button over here to duplicate a command. When I created this, I made the log success event first, and then I duplicated it and made customizations to that second step. So this is an easy way to make a long series of commands um, that are all similar. And we can even move our commands in a different order on the list using these up and down buttons. So that concludes our commanding demonstration. Now I'm going to switch gears and show you how to interact with a database without using any scripting. Here we have a partially made screen. At the bottom, we see data coming from SQL Server. This data represents a number of parts produced and expected for each line. We can see this data both as a bar chart and as a table. Now the data set for this demo only has three assets, but what if we had hundreds of assets? We wanna give an operator the ability to type in the name of an asset up here, and focus on the data for this particular asset. So on the top of this display here, we're going to build a screen that will let the user see the produced and expected numbers for the line number that he types in at the top. And if he needs to change these numbers, we're gonna let him do that as well. The first thing we need to do is set up a connection for our data set. So I'm gonna hop back over to Workbench here. And we're gonna drill into data connectivity, databases, SQL connections. And I already have a manufacturing demo item here. This is a connection to our database that contains the table we want. Right click on it and add a data source. A data source represents a table, query, or storage procedure that returns a data set. Let me give this data source a name. And now we need to tell it exactly what data we want. We do that here under the select command. I'm gonna hit configure command. And we want to get data, excuse me, data from a table. 
So we're going to leave this the same up here. We're going to select the particular table we want, which in this case is the line production two table. Now it builds a query for us automatically, but the query it uh, created here is going to return us all the rows from our data set. We don't want all the rows, we want just one. So I'm going to add a where clause here to help us pick which row we want. So where asset equals asset name. This is a parameter and we'll be specifying this when we run this data set. So we'll be giving it the name of the asset on the row we want. I'm going to hit next. As you can see, it detected my parameter here. It gave it a data type of varcar, which is fine. I'll leave that alone. And we'll hit finish. Now what the data set is trying to do is detect the columns or the schema in our data source. I need to give it some value. In this case, it doesn't actually matter as long as it doesn't return any errors. And as you can see, it detected the three columns in our data set. We're going to come back over to the data commands, and just to make sure it works, we're going to test our command. So it's asking me for the value again, and this time I need to give it an actual value of an asset in our table. So I'm going to hop back over to GraphWorks, select the first line in our data source, the asset column. I'm going to copy this value. I'm going to paste it into the value field. So now what I'm telling it is we want the row for line one. Hit next, and there we go. We have our row for line one. So this test is a success, which means my data source is set up correctly. There's one more thing I have to do here. We are going to want to let our operator update this value. So we're going to enable the update query. As you can see here, it generated this query for me automatically. This is because I have a fairly simple select command and it was able to detect what is needed to update um, our data. I didn't, don't need to make any changes here. I'll just hit apply. Now we're going to go back over to GraphWorks and add process points here to use that data source. I'm going to select process point, draw a rectangle here next to produced. Now we're working with integers, so I'm going to say we want zero decimal places, and I'm going to pick the data source we want. So just like in Workbench, we're going to go under data connectivity, databases, SQL Server, Manufacturing Demo, Data Sources, and there's our line production by line data source, which we just created. I'm going to drill underneath it and go to Columns and pick the Produced column, because what I want is a value from the Produced column in this case. I'm going to select our address bar up here, and we can see in the tag name, it's giving us a place where we can fill in the asset name to identify which row we want. I'm going to put the cursor in here and paste the same value that I used in our test earlier. Hit OK. We'll go into runtime. And as you can see here, I'm now showing the number of parts produced for line one. Now, this isn't dynamic yet. If I change this to line two, nothing happens. We still have a produced value of 400. So now we're going to make this dynamic. What we need to do. So we need to take the value from this process point. So this process point is looking at a local sim value for named line name. And we're going to use the value of that point inside our tag name. I'm going to edit the data source again and change it to an expression. And the way we're going to do this is using this request runtime value as data source feature at the bottom. Now, normally when this is unchecked, GraphWorks will evaluate this expression and return its value. But when I check this box, it'll evaluate the expression in, and excuse me, it'll evaluate this expression, but instead of returning the value, it'll evaluate that value as another data source and return the value of that data source. Now this could be a little hard to wrap your brain around, but when I check this box, I'm telling it that the result of my expression is going to be a tag name, and I want it to give me the value of that tag. The simplest way I can demonstrate this is I turn this tag here into a string. 
This is now a constant string. It's not going to change. And this, the result of the string is a tag name. If I hit OK, now one more thing here. I want to point out that when we checked that box, it added a value of keyword to the front of our data source. That tells us that we're using the request runtime value as data source feature. So if I go into runtime, we see our tag still works. If we look at the tooltip, it has the same value as it did before, but it's still not dynamic. I go into configure mode, we edit it again. So now I'm going to take this constant string and turn it into an expression with variable parts. And we're going to break this string apart and concatenate it. Let me use multiple lines so we can see what we're doing here. So I'm going to take this line one part and replace it with our simulation variable from our input field. So now we're concatenating three different strings together. Two of them are constants, and one of them is coming from a tag. So it's going to build a string for the particular row we want in this database. OK. Go into runtime. It's still showing the value of line one, as we can see in the tooltip. But now if I change this to line two, now it's showing me the produced numbers for line two. And if we look at the tooltip, we can see that the name of the point has changed. If I change line three, now we get the line three value. I can go into configure mode, duplicate this tag, and put it in the expected area here. We're gonna edit our data source, and instead of the produced column, we want the expected column. Now when I go into runtime, we can see both the produced and expected numbers for whatever line we type in here. Type in line two, we can see 300. I type in line, oops, line three, we have 400. Now I can go even further, select these two process points and change them into data entry process points. I'm gonna change this false to true. So now we're going to be able to write into these values. So I can choose what line I want to modify. Line two, let's say line two didn't actually produce as many as we expected. It only produced about half. So I change this to 150. I refresh. And as we could see, our line two number has changed in both places. I can switch to line three and say that we actually expected 500 parts for this line and on my values changed again so as you can see i can select whatever line i want type in whatever text i need if i had hundreds of these assets and be able to see and update these produced and expected numbers now this runtime value as data source feature can be used to make any part of the data source dynamic not just the parameter of a database tag our data source here only has three columns, but what if it had 20 or 30 columns? And we wanted to give the operator the ability to select not just the line, but the column that he wanted to look at and edit. We can do that using the same trick. I'm going to reveal some elements that I created earlier. Up here, we have another data entry field, which is a local sim called column name, where we're going to take the name of the column we want to look at. And here we have a process point with another expression using request runtime value as data source. So this looks very similar to the expression we had before, except here where we had the column name, we now have our process point, excuse me, our local sim column name value instead. So when I go into runtime, we can see that right now it's showing me the expected value for line one. And I can change this value here and see that it's been reflected below. Or maybe I want to look at the line three's produced number. And that's what we have here, the produced number for line three. And I can change it. And it gets reflected in my data set. 
As you can see, there's no limit to how you can modify a point name in runtime using this feature. And the values do not just have to come from user, excuse me, from user entry. You can use values from any tag that Iconics can read. You can modify a point name using values from OPC UA tags, Modbus, BACnet, SNMP, even other databases. You can have a database table full of point names and request their runtime values as data sources to create a display that's populated entirely by lists of points in a database. And none of this requires any scripting whatsoever. As you can see, you could perform endless automation of your displays using commanding and other native features of Iconics that are easy to maintain, guaranteed to be compatible with future versions and platforms. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Amanda for questions and to finish us up. Thank you very much for that informative presentation. Let me switch to my screen here and show you my conclusion slides. Okay, and now I'd like to talk to you about the Iconics Worldwide Customer Summit Transform 360. We recently rescheduled this in-person event to May 4th through 7th, 2021 at Foxwoods Resort and Casino in Connecticut. If you already signed up for the event and you'd signed up for the previous dates, we've just moved your registration already to the new dates, so no action needed on your part. If you haven't already signed up, I encourage you to do so. This event is going to be bigger and better in 2021. We have a number of exciting guest speakers lined up as well as compelling demos to show you. If you register by April 19th, you can do so at iconics.com slash transform360. We have a number of promotions that we put up on our social media pages from time to time, including complimentary registration promo codes. So I encourage you to follow us on social so you can see those and sign up. I really hope to see you all there at this live in-person event. I'd also like to share with you a number of on-demand webcast recordings that we have available at iconics.com slash webcast. If you've enjoyed today's webcast, you can see the other topics that we have covered this year. And not only do we have these North American webcasts, but we also have a number of international versions as well. While I'm taking questions today, I am going to leave up this slide. Here you can see the contact information for Oliver and Nicole in case you had any specific questions for them. I'm all, I also have the North American and International Solution Sales team here so you can get their contact info. And with that, I am going to pull up the questions and start asking our presenters the questions for today. Nicole, the first question is for you. If the commanding name of the display viewer is blank, does it default to the object name? Yes, it does. And that brings up an interesting point as to why we have a display name separate from the object name, is that in some cases you may want to send a command to multiple targets at a time, um, or you can have the user choose from a set of targets, and you can use the commanding name to specify multiple targets at a time. Um, whereas the object names must be unique, the commanding names can be shared. Okay, thank you, Nicole. Next question, why don't you take this one, Oliver? I thought GraphWorks 64 supported JScript. Is that still the case? Yeah, that's actually a good question. Um, yes, um, GraphWorks 64, um, when we started introducing the product in 2008, as a scripting engine, we included JScript and it would always run in Internet Explorer, um, that was fine. But moving into Silverlight, it just um, wouldn't, wouldn't work. So even today, JScript is still there because we didn't take that functionality out because customers may still use it. But um, when we deploy products um, from an Iconics, um, our, our solutions team, for example, we, we don't, all of our stuff is deployed in, in browsers, typically in Chrome. And um, so we don't use that, um, use JScript anymore, but it is still there. So that um, that is a valid point, good question. Thanks, Oliver. Nicole, I'll have you take this next one. Can you use the value of keyword inside of an expression to get more than one layer of tag resolution? Uh, actually, yes, you can. And as far as I know, there's no limit to how many times you can request a runtime value as a data source in a single point. Okay, thank you. Oliver, you can take this next one. Genesis 64 includes the ScriptWorks 64 module. Is workflow meant to replace it? 
another good question and i didn't get into the details of, of that during my presentation because of time but um yes um script work 64 still exists in the product um, as we said we're not taking those functionalities out um, workflow is just an, a modern way to look at creating um, scriptless feature sets um, across a project so is it going to replace it um, if you have been using uh, scriptwork 64 you can still use it it's totally fine um, it's to augment um, it's up to you it's your choice what you want to use um, but it's not we're not replacing genesis uh, i'm sorry scriptwork 64 it's still going to still going to be in the product Okay, thanks, Oliver. And actually, the next question I can take, uh, someone's asking about getting the recording. Not only are the recordings listed on the webcast page, uh, one day after this webcast, an automated email will go out to you with a link to this recording, so you can share that with your colleagues as well. Um, and with that next question, I'm going to give to Nicole. Does that value off feature work in HTML5? Uh, yes, it does. The value of feature or the request runtime value as data source works in all of our supported platforms. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and with that, we've hit our 45 minute mark, so I'm going to wrap things up for today. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today and thank Nicole and Oliver for a great presentation today. And we hope to all see you on a future Iconics webcast. Thank you. <laughs>